Hello, welcome to Real Crusades History. This is J. Stephen Roberts here. I hope you guys enjoyed my last video, which featured my song Siege in it. Siege is basically a song that, as I've been writing this novel about the Third Crusade, it was kind of inspired by that. The idea of a, a knight uh, sitting in a camp outside of a siege, watching as his wife dies in a bed before him. And uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed that video and the song, and it's available on my CD Scatheless, which is a CD of music that's heavily Crusades themed. I hope you guys will pick up a copy. There is a link down below. But anyway, today I want to pick up where I left off with my previous podcasts. So I just finished a fairly extensive series of podcasts about the late 11th century and the rise of the Latin West. And after those, I put up a documentary about the First Crusade. So now that we've really gone over the First Crusade pretty thoroughly, I want to talk about the immediate aftermath of the First Crusade. In particular, I want to talk about an event known to history as the Crusade of 1101. So, in the aftermath of the fall of Jerusalem in 1099, at the close of the First Crusade, this was an event that excited all of Europe. So suddenly, in the summer of 1099, Jerusalem was captured by Latin Christendom. And a new Latin Christian kingdom was established with Jerusalem as its capital right there in Palestine, so very far away from the great kingdoms of Western Europe. And with the establishment of Jerusalem as a Christian city, once again, after many centuries of the city being in Muslim hands, this was just something that created a lot of excitement and euphoria throughout Western Europe. Latin Christians were, were very joyous at this, and they felt that this was the great event of their generation. And because the First Crusade had been so enormously successful, many knights who had not participated in the original campaign wanted to join in this glory. Um, in addition, there was a call from the new crusader states that existed in Palestine and Syria, from uh, Godfrey of Bouillon, and later uh, his successor, a year later in 1100, his brother Baldwin I of Jerusalem, who became the first king of Jerusalem. Uh, these leaders were calling for reinforcements. They had fairly small standing armies in the crusader states, and they wanted their brothers back in the, the west, to come to their aid, for more knights to come. Uh, the new pope, Pope Pascal II, who had uh, succeeded Pope Urban II, who had died just before the fall of Jerusalem in 1099, Pascal II wanted to help with this, and so he began a fairly rigorous recruitment campaign. Basically, he mirrored a lot of the efforts that Pope Urban II had put in and wanted to encourage uh, he wanted to encourage Latin Christian knights to take the cross and head out to the new crusader states to bring aid to these new, these new kingdoms that were, or these new states that were sorely needing reinforcement. He sent out a series of papal legates throughout France and Germany and other regions to preach the cross. So that is to uh, encourage knights. Um, there was going to be indulgences offered to those who were willing to participate and take up this very solemn oath to go on crusade. In addition to that, Pope Pascal II condemned those who had deserted the Christian army, especially at its most dire points uh, during the siege of Antioch and in the events leading up to the capture of Jerusalem. This was basically viewed as a default on the crusader vow that these men had made, and the Pope threatened excommunication to those who did not make this right. Now, for those of you who watched my documentary about the First Crusade, there were a couple of major leaders of the First Crusade who fell into this category of deserters. Uh, one of them was Stephen of Blois, who was one of the most important 
nobleman in uh, Western Europe at the time. He was the Count of Blois and Chartres, uh, making him one of the great uh, French, uh, one of the great lords in uh, the region that is now France. He had fled just before the fall of Antioch, and this was considered a, a blow to morale. Um, later, another French nobleman, Hugh of Vermandois, who was in fact the brother of the king of France, King Philip I, Hugh had fled from the army as well in, uh, after the fall of Antioch. So, so men like this were in a very difficult situation. They had fled in a, in a way that was considered quite cowardly by their, their peers from this most sacred and now most famous of expeditions. If the first crusade had ended in disaster, I think men like Stephen of Blois and Hugh of Vermandois could have uh, gotten away with shirking their vow. You know, it would have been seen as, you know, God didn't favor this expedition. But now, because there had been this spectacular success, especially with the conquest of Jerusalem, uh, these men looked like cowards. And it must have been very difficult for them to go on with their their day-to-day -day lives, having abandoned this, what was amounted to the most important event uh, of that generation, the First Crusade. We think of a guy like Stephen of Blois, for example, Count Stephen. Throughout his lands, people would have been talking about this great success of the First Crusade. You know, the men who had been there were becoming legendary. Uh, you know, the leaders who had stuck it out to the end and who had ensured the success, you know, Bohemond, Godfrey of Bouillon, Robert of Flanders, uh, Robert Curthos of Normandy. These guys were heroes, while a guy like Stephen of Blois was the opposite of that. He was a disgraced coward. Interestingly, we have some chroniclers telling us that Stephen's wife, the Countess Adela of Normandy, Adela was in fact one of the daughters of the great William the Conqueror. So she was a Norman herself. Um, I can imagine being married to a Norman wife whose father was William the Conqueror and whose brother, in fact, was one of the great heroes of the First Crusade, Robert Curthos of Normandy, the Duke of Normandy. Um, she was very upset by the fact that her husband had come back as a disgraced coward. And uh, we have one chronicler who even tells us that when they were laying in bed together at night, Adela would nag her husband about you know, how he disgraced the family. He disgraced um, himself, and she urged him to return to the Holy Land. And so the Pope was, was basically launching a new call to arms, a new uh, uh, recruitment. And men like Stephen of Blois and Hugh of Vermandois, they, they took this up. And other men, you know, lesser men uh, who, who weren't as uh, high on the feudal hierarchy, they also, those who had deserted, they were taking up the cross as well again. And then, of course, men who had never gone in the first place were also taking the cross. There were a lot of clergy who were going to be involved in this new expedition. Uh, at the top of, the, the head of the expedition essentially was going to be Archbishop Hugh of Lyon, who was the papal legate. And he was accompanied by 11 other bishops and archbishops, at least. So this was um, quite an expedition. So other secular rulers who were going to be involved. Uh, Hugh of Vermandois, of course. Uh, interestingly, William IX, the Duke of Aquitaine, was going to be uh, involved in this. Now, William IX is a very interesting figure because he's known to history as a great poet and, and composer of songs. He's, in fact, known as the first troubadour. Um, we have a lot of his poetry and his songs that he wrote, and they're absolutely amazing. Uh, he, was, he was a striking individual, a, a brilliant writer. Um, he would be involved in quite a bit of crusading. He would actually, after this particular campaign, he would get involved in the crusades in Spain. Uh, he participated in some of the campaigns of Alfonso the Battler, uh, who conquered Zaragoza. But in addition to uh, Duke William, some other important noblemen who took the cross at this time, Count Stephen of Burgundy, uh, Duke Welf 
the fourth of, Bavar of Bavaria, the constable of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, so Henry the fourth's constable, whose name was Conrad, and also Count William of Nevers. So this was going to be a considerable expedition. One of the first contingents to depart, however, was a contingent of Lombards, which departed from Milan in September of 1100. They arrived in Constantinople in late February. Now, this particular expedition uh, behaved quite badly, according to both uh, Byzantine and Latin sources. The leaders appeared to have had fairly poor control over their armies as they advanced into Byzantine territory and uh, approached Constantinople. They were, there was some plundering of villages and that sort of thing, some violence against the locals. They clashed with Byzantine patrols. And this is confirmed by both uh, Albert of Aachen, who was not an eyewitness, but he was an important uh, Frankish chronicler from this period, especially he chronicled the, the life of uh, Godfrey Bouillon or the career of Godfrey of Bouillon in, in the Crusades. And also Anna Kemnena, Alexius' uh, uh, daughter in her chronicle, tells us the same thing. So uh, this was really just some disgraceful behavior from this Lombard contingent. Um, Alexius was not thrilled to have them around. Um, Albert of Aachen tells us that uh, the leaders of the army sort of tried to, uh, you know, wash their hands of the whole thing and said, well, these were just some, some loose cannons, you know, going out there doing some stuff that we didn't approve of. And um, I'm sure Alexius, you know, yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. But uh, he, he tried to ferry them across the Bosporus as quickly as he could where they massed at Nicomedia to await further Western forces. Now, Anna Komnena talks to us a bit about this particular expedition, this crusade of 1101, and she, she really gives us the impression that Alexius at this time really was not eager for this, this aid to come from the West or for these contingents to come from the West. He still had a lot of issues in Anatolia. Um, the first crusade had helped him quite a bit, in recovering large tracts of uh, western and southern Anatolia from this, the Turks. Uh, but he was nervous about the arrival of more armies from the west. Later, when he was uh, discussing some of these issues with his son, the next emperor, John, he kind of described this as a great commotion coming from the west and how it disturbed the, uh, the dignity of, uh, of the empire um, and disturbed the capital of New Rome. So, of course, by that we mean uh, Constantinople. So, yeah, Alexius was not thrilled about all this, and I think the behavior of this Lombard contingent, you know, we can understand why. So, the Lombards were joined by a representative of Alexius, and in this case, it is a Westerner. Uh, in fact, a quite famous one, Raymond IV of Toulouse. Now, if you recall, Count Raymond IV of Toulouse was one of the great leaders of the First Crusade. Um, he had been very close to Alexius since, uh, since his first arrival in Constantinople. Uh, Alexius' daughter, Anna Komnena, tells us that Alexius was quite fond of Raymond. He trusted him. Uh, they, they had a close bond. Uh, Raymond took seriously the idea of... Uh, of um, these, these uh, crusading activities as an aid to the Eastern, to, to the Eastern uh, Roman Empire, you know, Western Christians aiding Eastern Christians. And Raymond had, in fact, been Alexius' guest since uh, roughly the end of, uh, well, a year after the end of the First Crusade, since the summer of 1100. Uh, Raymond was involved in planning out the conquest of Tripoli and the establishment of the county of Tripoli in, uh, in the Levant um, as almost a, a proxy for Alexius. Uh, so Raymond uh, joins this Lombard contingent as, as an advisor representing the emperor. And uh, also uh, Anna Komnena tells us that... Uh, <laughs> Anna Kamena tells us that Alexius sent Raymond to try to mitigate the foolishness of this, this contingent of Lombards. Uh, now, we have to keep in mind, Anna was writing in hindsight. 
Uh, she wrote in the mid 12th century, you know, half a century or so after the, the events of the crusade of 1101. So she knew very well that it was going to be a disaster. So she portrays it as kind of a, a bumbling uh, expedition from the start. But the truth is, the Crusade of 1101, one thing we're going to, to learn as we continue this podcast, the leadership simply was not nearly as solid as what we had during the First Crusade. So there is something to be said for that. There was quite a bit of planning back in the West that went into this, but in terms of the quality of the actual leadership, it was sorely lacking, especially compared to the high quality of leadership we had in the First Crusade. And this is kind of revealed to us in this whole episode with the Lombards, and I'm going to get into that in just a second. But, but so Raymond joins the Lombards, and they're also joined by a contingent from France under um, the aforementioned Count Stephen II of Blois. And then they are joined by a small force under, uh, a small German force under the Constable Conrad from the Holy Roman Empire. So this army... This coalition, as it's beginning to form, gathers at Nicomedia in June of 1101, and they begin discussing what they're going to do. Now, Raymond and Stephen advise against any kind of campaign in the interior of Anatolia. They think that what should be done is they should march along the coastal road, which is under the control of the Byzantines, and head down into Syria, where they can... Join, uh, enter into the Crusader states and then give aid to the rulers of the Crusader states as they see fit. Now, this particular Lombard contingent is not happy with that idea because they have heard that, in fact, Bohemond, one of the great heroes of the First Crusade, is being held captive by the Danishmend Turks at Niskar. And this is true. Bohemond had um, lost a battle recently, uh, the previous year, with the Denishmen's, and he was being held as a, as a prisoner. Now, Raymond and Stephen have advised against... So, excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> the, the Lombards decided they wanted to rescue Bohemond. They thought this would be sort of a dashing thing to do. They would march on the Denishmen holdings, and they would, they would rescue Bohemon from Niskar. Now, Raymond and Stephen both advised against this, and uh, quite wisely, I think. Now, these are two men who understood the logistics of marching into the interior of Anatolia, and the Lombards simply ignored their advice. And so Raymond and Stephen kind of begrudgingly went along with them. So the Lombards with Stephen and Raymond departed June 3rd, carrying Milanese relics of St. Ambrose as well as Raymond's Holy Lance. On June the 23rd, they capture Ankara. Then they head northeast. At this point, they become increasingly harried by various Turkish scouts and contingents. And this is where the the tactics of the Turks in this territory become quite effective. So they were doing a lot of the, um, the harassing type, type tactics that we saw during the First Crusade, where they would come in, pepper the, the marching column with arrows, and then rush away and cause confusion and chaos. And this had been less effective during the First Crusade because of leaders like... Um, like Bohemond and Godfrey of Bouillon. But in this case, this contingent simply just was not as cohesive. Um, they, they, were not paying as, uh, they weren't paying attention to the experienced uh, men in their ranks, especially Raymond. And these, these Turkish harassing tactics are, are quite effective. So finally, the Crusaders encountered the main Danish men army near Merzifen in early August. And what ensued was a days-long, just brutal battle. After all this hard fighting, the Latins broke, and basically a panicked withdrawal and retreat uh, ensued, in which uh, the infantry and various camp followers, including women, were slaughtered by the Turks, 
uh, the you know some members of the cavalry, especially the leaders with their military entourages, were able to escape. Uh, Raymond, Stephen, and the Archbishop of Milan um, limped back to Constantinople. So this was the first disaster of the Crusade of 1101. And basically, uh, the Turkish harassing tactics had worked. The the speed, the uh, quick ambushes, uh, you know, coming in, pummeling hard, moving out, had worked eff- effectively. Now we remember how Bohemond had dealt with this, and it was by forming a very solid uh, um, infantry screen that that protected the army and sort of neutralized these tactics. And this just wasn't, there wasn't enough cohesion in this particular army to make that happen. So the next major contingent that was involved in the Crusade of 1101 was that under uh, the previously mentioned Duke William IX of Aquitaine. And he departed in March, and he was joined by wealth of Bavaria at Constantinople. Just around the time that the Lombards were in fact leaving Nicomedia in early June. So as William and Welf were pre- preparing to set out, they were briefly joined by the Count of Nevers, Count William of Nevers. And what happens next kind of exemplifies some of the disorganization that was endemic to this crusade. Um, for some reason, Count William decided not to join this larger contingent that was being you know, formed, and he struck out on his own to try to catch up with the Lombards. And, you know, again, this was, this was against uh, better advice coming from people who, who knew what they were talking about. And, you know, the Count of Nevers, he, he didn't have the experience to really understand what he was getting into. So um, they make this, this hard march to try to catch up with the Lombards, and, you know, you can imagine what it must be like, uh, you know, marching across Anatolia. Um, if you've ever been to that part of the world, I mean, it's just an absolutely desolate and brutal territory. And it's so incredibly large. So at Ankara, the Count of Nevers realizes his mistake. So he abandons this pursuit and then decides to swing south toward Konya. Uh, his goal now is... Uh, you know, too late, but a more sensible goal, and that is he's going to try to uh, get to the route that leads into Syria. So basically, he's going to try to do what uh, what was originally advised by people like Count Raymond and uh, Alexius. However, during this push, he's harassed very seriously by uh, by Turks, most likely Seljuks. When he finally reaches Konya in mid-August, he finds that his force is far too small to, of course, do anything at that city. So he makes a dash for Cilicia. Count William of Nevers, his army was ambushed by a force of Turks at Ergeli, and it was devastating. The army was destroyed. So it's it's similar to what happened previously. Uh, The infantry is massacred. Uh, a A lot of knights are killed as well. And, you know, some of the leaders are able to escape to Antioch. So there's the second big, uh, big nothing of the crusade of 1101. So the third major thing that happens is that William the ninth of Aquitaine and wealth of Bavaria are joined back at Constantinople now by another of the disgraced deserters of the first crusade, Hugh of Vermandois. They are also joined there by a noble woman by the, the name of Ida of Austria and she is involved in this more as a pilgrimage. Um, but she is there with a military force. We can't really describe her as a leader in this, but she's uh, hoping to make it to the Holy Land. And from Constantinople, they set out in mid-July. Uh, they are at first following the route that the First Crusade took from Nicaea to Dorylaeum. Philomelium, and Konya. However, once they're out of Byzantine territory, again, Turkish harassment becomes very intense. And once again, there's not the cohesion there to really deal with it. The Christians are ambushed by a force of Turks under Kili Arsalan at Ergeli in September 
And what follows is the absolute destruction of this army. Again, very similar to what we've, we've seen before. Uh, most of the leaders are able to escape. Um, infantry killed, you know, it's, it's a devastating loss for, for this army. Um, so most of the, infantry, uh, most of the uh, leaders are able to, to get to Christian territory. At Tarsus, Hugh of Vermandois, who has been seriously wounded, he dies there. Meanwhile, Ida of Austria simply vanishes. We don't know what happened to her. She was most likely killed. There were stories circulating later that she ended up in some uh, Turkish harem somewhere. But most likely, that's probably, uh, that's probably just storytelling. The survivors of Ergoli, uh limped on through Cilicia, and they ended up at Antioch. William of Aquitaine there... Uh, helped Raymond of Toulouse to capture Tortosa. Meanwhile, um, another veteran of this failed crusade of 1101, Stephen of Blois, went on to the kingdom of Jerusalem, where he would join King Baldwin I for some campaigning. And that summarizes the events of the crusade of 1101. Really, just kind of a, a damp squid, if you will, at best. Um, a Devastating defeat for the Crusaders in this campaign and an impressive victory for the Turks of Anatolia, the Seljuks and the Danish Mens. Um, I think what we can get from this is how effective the um, hit and run tactics of the Seljuks could be. Um, you know, they just they just absolutely outfought uh, the Crusaders in this case. But I think the other thing we can get from this is the importance of cohesive leadership and a cohesive force in, in a crusade. Um, now, in the history of the crusades, there's only a few instances in which you have armies of crusaders marching across Anatolia. Uh, there's the first crusade, the crusade of 1101, the second crusade, and then Frederick Barbarossa's crusade, which is part of the third crusade. Um, in the first case, it's successful, and the Turks are defeated. And I think, again, we have to credit this largely with the leadership, especially Bohemond's leadership in, in points of crisis. But also, Godfrey and Raymond uh, showed some impressive leadership as well, as did uh, Robert Kurthos of Normandy and Count Robert II of Flanders. In the case of the Crusade of 1101, we've got the opposite. I think we have a series of leaders who really don't know what they're getting into. They've kind of set out on this thing with a lot of enthusiasm because they've heard these stories of the great successes of what happened in, in the Holy Land. Um, but they, they just don't know what they're dealing with. And interestingly, there's a lot of uh, rejection of good advice. Um, the advice that Raymond of Toulouse and Stephen of Blois give is good. Um, the idea that, and Alexius too, you know, Alexius advises, uh, advises these forces to basically bypass what's going on in Anatolia, to stick to Byzantine controlled territories in Anatolia, to follow the coastal road, and just enter into the Crusader states from the north. This would have been ideal, I think, um, because there were reinforcements needed in the Crusader states, uh, they, you know, these uh, the uh, Principality of Antioch and the Kingdom of Jerusalem, etc., were short of men, and they could have used these guys. They could have used these knights, but instead, these armies are just squandered on these pointless campaigns in in Anatolia. And it's interesting how none of these armies really could coordinate very well with each other. We have basically three separate campaigns of, of guys kind of blundering off into um, Anatolia and getting massacred by the Turks. And um, again, this is where good advice is ignored. Uh, Alexius and Raymond advise, you know, waiting and uh, getting everybody to join together in, uh, in Nicomedia. But uh, this just isn't what happens. Um, there is something that I want to mention, and that is the commentary from Matthew of Edessa. Now, Matthew of Edessa was an Armenian cleric who wrote a very valuable chronicler 
a, excuse me, a very valuable chronicle that covers um, events from the early Crusades era. And he is quite critical of the Byzantines during this campaign. He's convinced that the Byzantines were actually actively trying to, to um, thwart this campaign and were trying to uh, lead them to disaster. Um, he thinks the guides intentionally led some of these, these troops into disasters. It's, it's very interesting. Um, Matthew of Edessa tends to be well-informed about this kind of thing, especially from this part of the world. He's someone who can be both very critical of the Franks and very critical of the Byzantines. I think we have to take into account the fact that he was partial to the Armenian church, and so that therefore he was pretty hostile to the Greek church and pretty hostile to the Byzantines. But again, it's just kind of interesting. I mean, is there any truth to this? I have no idea, you know, but, but he is quite critical of, of Byzantine conduct during this campaign. However, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure you can, you can, you know, lay the blame of, of what happens here uh, at the feet of the Byzantines. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced at all of that. Um, I think that um, I think quite clearly there are several instances where some of the the leaders in this thing make some very ridiculous choices. Indeed, some choices that are just baffling. Um, you know, the Count of Nevers going off on his own. Uh, you know, this idea of going and trying to rescue Bohemond from the the northeast, the most hostile and part of uh, Anatolia. It's just um, one term that is used for the crusade of 1101 sometimes is the the crusade of the ill-prepared or the crusade of the faint of heart because it was so heavily populated by individuals who had initially refused to get involved in the first crusade when Pope Urban was first preaching and then once you had the success um, you know they wanted to jump in on it and also of course because it, it involved so many people who had deserted in the first place but again, so yeah, this, um, again, I think the crusade of 1101, it really does show us the importance. If you're going to march an army across Anatolia, you better have some really good leadership. Uh, the next time a crusader army uh, tried to march across Anatolia was the second crusade. And it was similar to what we see here in the crusade of 1101. Uh, this time the leaders were Conrad III of Germany and Louis VII of France, both of whom were not very good field commanders at all, and who did not organize their armies well. And then the next time it happened, it was successful, and that was the crusade of Frederick Barbarossa in 1190, um, at the very start of the Third Crusade. Frederick Barbarossa successfully leads his army, a very large army, across Anatolia. He defeats uh, both Byzantine and Turkish forces. In fact, he delivers a very serious defeat to the Seljuk Turks. Um, so he succeeds in doing it, but, but again, he was a very effective leader, and he had some effective leaders with him. That army was, was more cohesive. So I think we can kind of see, just from those four examples, what it is that it takes, really, to, to do this thing, to, to make this very hard march across Anatolia. Most crusades would not, were not interested in doing this. And of course, once Richard the Lionheart had conquered Cyprus, uh, that made it sort of irrelevant to, or, or not necessary at all to try and march across Anatolia because you could simply launch a ship from Italy or wherever and land on Cyprus and then, you know, figure out what you're going to do from there. But um, anyway, just some interesting stuff. So yeah, the Crusade of 1101 and how it just absolutely came to a, a, a uh, wretched end and just this, this incredible victory for the Turks. I think we have to really, you know, take note of the the uh, fighting ability of the Turks. I mean, it's, it's quite impressive. Um, this, the swift mounted archers, uh, they're able to just like, you know, pepper this, this uh, Western army with, with arrows while riding their horses, while galloping, you know, just like rushing past. You've got to be able to defend against that. You know, you've got to have the cohesion to do that. And uh, these armies just did, did not have that. Now, how did this impact the larger crusades movement? Well, for one thing, it dampened some of the enthusiasm of 1099. Um, it, was, it was sort of a, uh, 
a wake up call that this is not just about, you know, we're going to head out there and God's just going to work a miracle for you. Because a lot of people interpreted what happened in the first crusade as a miracle. They didn't, um, you know, people who weren't close to it didn't see uh, the, the effective leadership and the effective uh, fighting that was so crucial to this. Um, and the other thing is it, it was, it was a negative for the crusader states. It was a definite negative for the crusader states. If these armies had simply followed the initial advice of Alexius and Count Raymond and just marched along the coastal road and entered in, into the crusader states without ever making contact with the Turks of Anatolia, then the crusader states would have received a very big shot in the arm of, of men, of infantry and knights. This could have been used by uh, the leaders of these of of these territories. You know, I, I suspect there were there were guys who would have s s uh, set up shop there and uh, you know joined the armies permanently. We had effective leaders in these regions at that time, like Tancred and Baldwin the First of Jerusalem. Uh, so, so yeah, that it was it was a real. Um, it was a negative for the Crusader states because they, they didn't get reinforcements that they could have used. Uh, and then on top of that, it was just a huge squandering of lives and uh, funds. You know, we, we met a, a lot of people, you know, a lot of, of uh, warriors were lost in this. So, so yeah, I just want to talk a little bit about that. Hope you guys um, enjoyed this podcast. And if you like the music that is featured in these podcasts, that is my music, and I released a CD recently called Scatheless, which you will find a link to that uh, down below. So follow that link, pick up a copy of the CD. I think you will enjoy it. You can also, of course, get it in electronic format. You can download it as MP3s from Amazon. So it would be a great way to show support for what I'm doing here at Real Crusades History. So please do pick up a copy of that. Also. If you like what I'm doing, please support me on Patreon. Uh, those who, who support me on Patreon at $5 monthly or more, they get a complete back catalog of Real Crusades History podcasts, which I send to them on request. What you do is you just become a, 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 a patron on Patreon at $5 monthly or more, and then send me a private message on Patreon and say, hey, I want to get that, that podcast folder, and I send that over to you. So that's a lot of history that you can have on your hard drive and listen to at your convenience. Plus that, I do exclusive podcasts for my Patreon supporters as well. And I answer questions from my Patreon supporters when they when they private message me on uh, Patreon. In fact, a lot of uh, Patreon questions end up as podcasts. I, I answer them just as podcasts. So um, You can also donate to Real Crusades History via PayPal. There's a link to that below as well. So thanks very much for listening, guys. I hope everybody's doing well. I'll talk to you soon.